live from SABC Studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Welcome to this evening's edition of The Watchdog. My name is William Vogo. Thank you for joining us on the show tonight. I refuse to accept that all of us came here to elect one person to be the premier of our province. What we have done was the election of 16 million people of Gauteng to be the premier, not me. The rise and rise of Panyaza Lesufi. What does the new premier of South Africa's richest and most populous province have to offer? Well, he's my studio guest. With Premier Lesufi's and his party's eyes firmly on the 2024 national and provincial election, the guest after him is a visiting US-based voter rights activist who specializes in creating strategies for increased electoral participation. This is The Watchdog. Andrek Panyaza Lesufi is, the, is Gauteng's new premier. 22 for Honorable Simanga and 38 for Henry. Gauteng MEC of Education, Banyaza Lesufi, is the new premier of South Africa's economic hub, Gauteng. Lesufi takes over the reins of the province from David Makura, who resigned this week. The new number one citizen of the province, outlining his glimpse of his vision, previously disadvantaged areas are his key focus. The people of Gauteng, as long as our townships are still the way they are, our freedom has not arrived. As long as we still have informal settlements, we have not accomplished our tasks. As long as we still have dirty and smelly hostels, we have not achieved our goals. As long as our people in rural areas struggle to get water, then our mission for a better free South Africa must continue. Lesufi bids farewell to the education sector, where he has operated from since the days as spokesperson to the Minister of Basic Education, Enji Mutsaka. The Premier couldn't hide his pain of separating with the education sector. Today marks the end of my lifelong partnership with the education sector. A pain I can't hide. I want to thank those that identified me, sharpened me, supported me when I never thought that I'll be, part for this, I'll be part of those that will fight for the struggle for quality education. I want to name the late Eamon Msani, Patricia Maloka, Dr. Khwati Tindeza, but the special thanks is reserved to my mother, my mentor, and a person who guided me through my life. Minister in Jimutseha and the Mutseha Former Premier David Makura says Lusufi is the best man to take Gauteng to greater heights. I know, I know deep down uh, that uh, he is going to take this province forward. He's uh, the most capable man. He knows the program of where to take Gauteng. So I'm very pleased. I'm Premier Lusufi will announce his new executive tomorrow afternoon, where he says the deployment will be guided by education and skills. Samkele Masego, SABC News, Johannesburg. Samkele Masego, uh, who of course attended the inauguration today, or swearing in rather, of uh, the new Premier of Gauteng. Premier Lusufi? How does that sound? I'm still turning when they say premium because I thought premium <laughs> could have stayed behind. <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, of the country's 60 million or so uh, people, um, uh, only a handful 
yeah. you know, can become presidents or premiers. So you belong now to uh, whatever may happen after this. Uh, the fact <laughs> is you, you, you're going to belong to a very exclusive and, shall I say, elite even uh, um, um, a club. Uh, something that, of course, um, to those, to people who are self-respecting, um, you know, confers a lot of power, but at the same time, a lot of responsibility. Um, one hopes that whoever occupies this kind of position uh, becomes aware of the responsibilities yeah. that they have. Yeah. They take <coughs> those responsibilities seriously. seriously. And they are willing and able to leave a mark once they're gone. Where do you think you're going to begin? Uh, th thanks, Voyo. Uh, and that is why my opening remarks uh, in the legislature, I indicated that it must not be about me, it's about 16 million South Africans who are premier. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a reminder that we serve, uh, and myself uh, with humility, uh, dignity, but most importantly, uh, know that uh, it's a temporary task that has been assigned to you. Uh, it's not forever. Uh, and you're only going to be measured to the good things that you're doing. The bad things will attract negativity and many other things. So it's indeed an honor, but mixed emotions. Uh, I must be honest for you. Uh, if we have hospitals without medication, and you raise your hand and say, I'll fix it. If you have houses that are not finished, um, you've got communities without water. Um, you've got people that are going to bed uh, with an empty stomach. You, you have to raise your hand and say, I really think that I'm capable to deal with those things. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult, scary. Um, and the, the level of lawlessness, the level of crime, the level of corruption, vandalism, uh, and uh, you, 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 you say I'll be the face uh, of either fixing them or worsening them. So, so, so it's a balancing act that uh, we must execute. And uh, I'm humbled that the political party that I represent or come from felt that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm equal to the task. Well, virtually everyone who has occupied I mean, this position and other positions start, starts mm -hmm. by saying exactly, you know, uh, what you've just said, no. they're humbled and then promise to do the best they can. But at the end of their term, or those who do finish their terms, um, you know, it becomes a different story when completely. When, I mean, you saw this coming, there have been mm. conversations uh, over the past few weeks, especially. Yeah. So you knew exactly what you were in for. Presumably, you have done some analysis or looked back and reflected. Yeah. Why do you think people end up not doing what they promised to do at the beginning of this? I know people who do, uh, very few who don't. Um, but I'm a junkie for accountability. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a junkie for uh, immediate solution. Uh, I think that's how my parents raised me that when a problem starts small it's easy to resolve it but if it <laughs> prolongs it becomes extremely difficult uh, my father used to say uh, if the door handle starts to shake if you can't fix it at that time you'll never open that door so i really think that uh, what we are referring to is people who leave small things to grow and they become dif it becomes difficult for them to resolve them and that's why they end up not doing what they promised to do so you need to be fast quick and be decisive. Take your decisions and deal with the consequences of your decision. But if you keep postponing taking a decision, I think uh, we'll have uh, those kind of challenges. But I've learned from many leaders. Uh, I was there when uh, Matulo Mutsekha, for example, was the premier. Um, Bazima Shulowa, uh, I was working within the communication team. Nomvula Mukonyani, Paul Mashatile, uh, uh, David Makura. So, I'm, I'm pretty aware of the challenges and the task and the, the trappings of the office. Well, they are, I mean, as everyone has been saying, as much about the people who occupy the position you're occupying now, and of course the rest of your executive, these problems are as much about 
you as people who occupy these positions as they are about the hundred and something old uh, movement that you are part of and a lot of the failings um, that we see are more because of how this organization functions rather than the potential or the ability or capabilities um, of the people who are actually occupying office. Would you agree, disagree? I'm open-minded, so I'm, I'm a debater. So if people have views that the failings of government have caused uh, the movement to go through the pain that is going through or the suffering that is going through or uh, um, loss of voter support, um, I don't think that we should uh, argue against that. Um, evidence is there. And I think the organization have accepted that um, hence the renewal agenda, hence the need for us to uh, avoid being inward focused, um, that uh, there must be voter contact as much as possible and um, we must deliver services. But I, I dispute the fact that uh, this movement or this government has done nothing uh, for the last 28 years. Um, I, I dispute and reject any view that there was a better government than the government of the African National Congress. Uh, and I dispute and reject any idea uh, that wants to project that uh, everything that is associated with this movement is failure, despair, on wrong things. Uh, I think there are very good things that this movement have done and that tangible evidence out there. And you could have done a lot better. I think that's what people are saying. Well, you underestimate uh, the... You, you could have done um, a lot better, but the movement's focus shifted, you know, uh, away from the goals that the ANC set itself as a liberation movement. And it became a lot more inward looking. Of course, opportunists and other people came yeah. um, onto the picture, clouded the picture. But in the process, in many instances, the shift focus, I mean, the, 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 the focus shifted to all the things that actually didn't matter, you know, uh, as far as millions of South Africans are, are concerned. And the question, I guess, now is moving away from labeling or having to dispel whatever notions mm -hmm. of whether you did well or did badly, but to actually focusing on what needs to be done and perhaps cutting away or closing your ears uh, and eyes completely to uh, the people you regard uh, or forces you regard as you know detractors to actually just let your deeds speak for themselves i think that's the attitude i want to embrace uh, let our actions speak for us let our deeds speak for us uh, because i think there are things that need to happen uh, there are things that went wrong we can't dispute that but uh, We've given an opportunity to change things, um, and I think we are combat ready. Uh, tomorrow we are announcing the executive uh, that will join us in the hotel, and uh, we'll make those analysis and feel that uh, Houthi must be a better place, must be a cleaner place, it must be a place that uh, we can render services, we must respond to the challenges of the energy, and recently challenges of water, so we have to respond to those things, uh, we can't avoid them, but uh, we can say, give us time so that we can deal with those issues. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I mean, a few hours ago, mm -hmm. your uh, counterpart and comrades in, in Limbobo, Stanley Mutawata, uh, announced uh, a cabinet reshuffle where he removed three emissaries. Incidentally, these are people who were on the other slate, you know, um, Dixon Masemula, so yeah. I mean, against yeah. him. Uh, Paul Libo Shelo mm -hmm. and Tandi Moraga have now been 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 asked. and as the premiers, I mean the premier uh, would have us believe uh, it was all performance related. Of course, I mean it simply uh, it cannot be. And as you say, I mean you are announcing your cabinet uh, 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 tomorrow. Are the is the politics that preceded, you know, your election as provincial chairperson and subsequently? you being premier today, going to be a factor in how you choose your provincial executive? No. We've moved beyond that. Uh, naturally, when you compete, uh, there'll be people that will be more comfortable with my leadership, and there'll be people that will be comfortable with 
somebody's leadership style. Uh, the wrong thing that we think is, is that all those things are permanent. Uh, maybe historically they were permanent, but I don't think in our province. Immediately after conference, we embraced each other, we worked together. Uh, I was unanimously uh, nominated, and I was nominated in the PC of the ANC by Lohan Maile, who I competed with him. Now in the legislature today is the one that nominated my name. We have gone beyond those issues. I don't think that uh, the cabinet will announce tomorrow uh, will be influenced by that. It's going to be influenced by skill, talent and commitment and the uh, ability uh, for people to hit the ground running because we're 18 months away from the next round of elections. So we don't need people that say, I'm still going to learn and know all these particular things. So you just need people that can hit the ground running. So the cabinet will be really, um, and, and I, I, don't, I don't even think that's going to be a major uh, uh, changes. Uh, remember the current uh, 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 vacancy that we have is the vacancy of education. So we just have to fill one or two, maybe move uh, certain portfolios and proceed with the work at task, uh, the, the task at end. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, th those of us who have been following these processes quite uh, closely can see, you know, how uh, efforts are being made to bring all of you together so yeah. that you read from the same hymn book. But it still doesn't remove other possibilities or, or uh, um, what 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 may have to happen because oh. of uh, you know I mean politics is is politics. On the one hand, you would need I mean politically at least to be seen to be uh, sort of keeping those closest to you close yep. um, to you know uh, show that you. You, you trust them, yeah. but on the other hand, you still have to manage the optics uh, of not wanting to be seen to be, uh, uh, um, you know, going um, for, for, for your adversaries. But in your case, unlike in Stan Matabata's case, for example, I um, mean, you have a provincial executive that um, in the main or majority uh, of whom uh, were on a different slate in the run up to your yeah. your your elective i mean provincial conference. provincial conference which then adds a different dynamic and the delicate balance that you have to be strike uh, is going to be harder for you than is the case in the eastern cape or in in the bobo and i'm not sure about the eastern cape when they've got the regional conference that the court declares that there are challenges of it. we go through all those difficulties it's how matured we are and how we understand our mandate to deal with issues that confront us. Um, I, I really feel that if you postpone service delivery and you postpone servicing our people and you are um, obsessed with our internal differences and to say this person, regardless of their capabilities, talent, because they supported me at a conference, then they must be uh, an MEC for finance. I can tell you, uh, you, are, you are not doing good for for the movement and the people that expect the movement to service them. Uh, let talent, commitment, hard work, and many characteristics uh, <clears throat> determine uh, the caliber of people that he wants to deploy. Mm. In fact, we should bring <clears throat> nicely to uh, how it was often, we've seen this in the past, especially um, with your national executive. Uh, yeah. Remember, this was the case in Gauteng, you remember? Um, um, when one MC had to be shifted, so yeah. to accommodate, because Oftentimes, people would deal with the balance of political forces yeah. uh, by how they dispense <laughs> patronage. <Patronists. laughs> you know, where yeah. you find that you end up with a bigger or bloated, you know, executive because you have to accommodate as many people as well. I'm keen to know what your preference is. You keep your executive where it is now, do you go for less, or do you go for more? And why? I, I think we need to strengthen the capacity of the state. Um, the mistakes we have made is that we focus on cabinet and forget the actual functionaries that need to run the state. Uh, and they've got endless opportunities. The only thing you need there is skill and talent. Um, I, I come from the education background and I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with people who are skilled, properly skilled, and people who can do the task. So, I, I think ICE will always be is an MEC for whatever, whatever, but to have a proper HOD, to have a proper CFO, uh, if you are a, a building department, you have uh, engineers and all other things. So I'm obsessed with that. I really feel that 
uh, if we can't attract the best, we'll never deliver. Uh, you can have a best MEC, but if there are no people there, so the cabinet that we're going to have is a balance of those things, uh, which HODs can strengthen a certain MEC's weaknesses and all that. So it's not only about them alone, but uh, it's everything that we need to do uh, to ensure that we've got a team, not an. So let's get into the issues, um, and, but also the optics around them. Let's take life as demand, for yeah. example. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of criticism leveled at the MEC who then took over, that they made no difference. And you're saying that at times it's not about the MEC, but whether you have the right people where it matters, yeah. you know, uh, within the bureaucracy. Why? For something that, has, that continues to be the albatross around the provincial government snack, yeah. you would have thought that by now we would have moved with so much speed uh, uh, that would dispel any notion that either there was a, it was something deliberate or there was no capacity or, or anything that people see as a reason behind what happened. Um, uh, around the life as it demands, as it demands. I'm keen to know just from where you sit. How, how do how, how do you see that? You know, uh, we know what went wrong. Yeah. You know, but in now trying to deal with uh, what this episode threw up. You know, what is your analysis and how do you plan to deal with a situation like that, like life as demands? To me, it confirmed that we've got institutions that. Yeah, punish wrongdoing, uh, either inside government, within the justice system, uh, and within the law enforcement agencies. Uh, I mean, when this matter came, the Premier appointed uh, the then deputy, the retired deputy uh, uh, justice, Dikham uh, Seneke. Um, the state was transparent. The hearings were open, everyone raised there are limitations on the transactions and people were identified and uh, uh, the state was compelled to pay compensation and the state paid everyone that uh, 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 needed to be paid and um, it went to the higher level of, uh, of the law uh, where we have cases now in the court of law but also political accountability, um, the HOD of the department um, and those that were responsible politically uh, were, were also moved out uh, of the department. So, life has demanded to me represent uh, the ability of the state, but uh, a painful chapter that something of this nature can just happen in front of our eyes. And uh, we find ourselves in the situation that we find ourselves in. But um, in terms of the machinery of the state, uh, the blame can be that it's grinding slowly, uh, but at least you can see uh, that the institutions uh, that are mandated to deal with this kind of issues have executed those uh, mandates. You were mentioning uh, I mean, compensation. I mean, uh, a lot of criticism of our health system is that a lot of money is spent On compensating litigation. people for negligence. Yeah. You know, yeah. people who then make huge claims. Yeah. Money that should be going to actually providing health services to the poor especially yeah. ends up having to pay these huge um, um, bills hence you have hospitals like Raima Musa you know um, um, in, 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 in trouble has there been have there been conversations I mean as a member of executive now uh, within the provincial government about how to actually deal with this with this with this problem We've got a very propose, uh, proposition on the table now, for you. Uh, sh should we buy everything <laughs> from third uh, parties? Uh, or should we build the capacity of the state to do these things on their own? So what I like weigh the pros and cons. Yeah, what I like about your question, you don't question the clinical experts that we have, the doctors that have taken us through COVID, the good work that they've done, the problems that we're having, a problem of third parties, uh, cleanliness, uh, uh, infrastructure that is collapsing. But the core mandate of hospitals, let us be honest, uh, you, I'm not saying you don't get que in, in, in queries there, but the expertise is intact. It's just the 
the outside component of it where a person that need to buy a certain equipment they've not bought that equipment or they've not delivered quality equipment so we have to review whether should we rely uh, on third parties and it's a third party of a third party uh, uh, we buy from you you go and buy from somebody who go and buy in china we've got intergovernment relations you can buy it from china and bring it here so we've got that value proposition that is on the table uh, uh, that we think that it will assist us to mitigate those uh, those matters but it's also patient management uh, many people will prefer to wake up uh, at 4 a.m for a hospital that will open at 8 o'clock because they don't trust the system uh, they don't trust that they will be seen by a doctor they don't trust that they will be attended properly so we need to overhaul and review that and that is high high on our agenda i'm i'm i really believe crime and uh, the health system um, will be something that uh, we need to be judged on because if you can improve it and, and turn it around um, uh, we're going to be in trouble you know I'm, i I'm, i follow private hospital medication just to pick up lessons and other things there's one hospital in, hospital in alberton in Albertin, they left where they were to a new premises. Uh, they've done it cleanly, and I and sometimes I assume if it was us, <laughs> that process alone would have either uh, cost us a huge amount of money, lost lots of equipment and and other. But they've done it clinically, and we should learn from them. Um, and I, I follow such. Uh, uh, cases so that uh, one can understand uh, the change management component of it, of the IC systems, uh, the leadership component, and, and, and many other things. So, so uh, we, we need to change uh, everything within the public education system, uh, public health system. Actually, I say the cost of living in this country is too high, not on the basis of price, on the basis that the public good that needs to be rendered by the state is rendered by the private sector. You spend more money on what? On alarms, CCTV at your house. But if you have a public good like police, will not do that. You spend more money on what? On fuel. If you have a public good like public transport, you will not do that. You spend more money on what? Private education of your child. If you have quality public education, you will not spend that amount of money. You spend more money on what? On water and electricity through the municipalities. But because there's no skilled talent there, the price is too high. So, so we need to change that. Public good must be reliable, dependable, but quality as well. And if you do that, you reduce the cost of living. And people then go and shop around. Uh, either they want to go to Western Cape or go to Limpopo, go outside the country to, because they really feel that the cost of living is, is, is not the way it wants to. So we need to change that. Um, if public goods is going to be expensive, then we are failing in our mandate to be a government. Because those things, government are meant to render those services. But why now they are rendered 80% in our country by the private sector? Uh, and because they are rendered by the private sector, the cost escalations are just too much. So we need to arrest that. I want to bring into the conversation people who are watching yep. who have sent uh, yeah. some tweets. But on, on the back of what you've uh, just said, two things um, for me. One, I'm keen to know what you think is the impact or influence of the whole tender system you know, in the problems uh, that we're seeing, whether it's around, you know, public health um, uh, um, or any other area for, for, for that matter. And secondly, just your thoughts, because often we hear people saying there is also the burden of foreigners. I mean, you know the Limpopo yeah. MEC yeah. saga uh, that get, got the country yeah. going for, for, for quite a while. I'm keen to know because Johannesburg, um, is I mean receives a lot of yeah. uh, 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 hundred million people, yeah, uh, hundred thousand people yeah. per month. And what yeah. your thoughts are? Well, that, there's nothing wrong with the tender system. What is wrong that we think we are married to it, uh, and we're not married to that system. I mean, uh, we 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 really believe that without it we can't survive. Uh, I really believe we can just build capacity, uh, lots and lots of capacity. Um, so that we don't rely on the tendering system alone. Because if we rely on it, it, it gets abused, uh, the cost escalation, 
I mean, it's public knowledge. Um, sometimes we're in an office in the department and across the stationery shop. Uh, if you just go across the stationery shop, you get an envelope at seven cents. But if you have to go through another thing, you get it at 70 cents. So it's nothing wrong. Where we need uh, the tendering system, we must. But I think we've reached a stage where we can build strong capacity within the state um, and render those services cheaply. And uh, we know we have to feed patients every day, every year. Uh, don't you think we must not build the capacity to feed them and buy food buy in bulk, safe, and and many other things, uh, medication and, 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 and other things. But it, it's a something that we, 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 we need to attend and, and review as a state. But remember, when government was established, uh, it was based on foresight. We've never been there before. So those that developed the laws and crafted them. Uh, it was on the basis that we think this is that we have gone through it. So I really believe there is an, an agent need to review uh, many of these things because uh, those that crafted them, I think they were intelligent, they were brilliant. And I they mean, meant well. Uh, they meant well. Uh, they meant well. I mean, me and you, I don't think we knew uh, that the public protector will be such a powerful office. Uh, uh, me and you, um, we didn't know either the ICIU special investigation separate from the Hawks and many other things uh, will be uh, uh, such institutions. But they crafted them uh, and they gave them to us. Now that we've gone through them, are there no limitations and gaps that we think we can just close and, 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 and review? We are scared to do that uh, because we are told some of these things are sacrosanct. You can't change the constitution. You can't do this you can i really believe you can uh, if if the intentions are good and if the intentions are going to enhance um, a service delivery and many other related things but is there something for you that requires a constitutional can you think of one area that requires some constitutional changes yeah like uh, let me give you an example using my case <laughs> um, when you become an mec they say that you're not involved in tenders. You must not do tenders. You must not um, uh, be informed about who's awarded a tender, how much was paid for that particular person. But if something goes wrong there, they say to you, I really believe that. Give me all the powers to manage everything in the department so that I'm held accountable. And the separation of an executive authority and an accounting authority <laughs> uh, was there for a purpose. But the reality is that when we are accused of oversight on everything that goes wrong under our leadership, but the law says you must not uh, be part of this, uh, I really believe there is a huge gap. But nothing uh, stops you from um, holding those officials accountable, asking questions, but it become an after keeping effect. them on their toes. No, it becomes an after effect because we have to get quarterly reports or yearly reports, a signed annual report. And by that time you sign and that information is brought to you, it's late. Uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't be told. Uh, I don't even. I don't think there's a minister that knows how much that department have paid the service providers last night. <laughs> we don't know that. Uh, but if there is something that comes, you no, know, you are the ultimate authority of the department. You must know. But the law says you must not be involved in that. So you can't say I must not be involved. But if something goes wrong and something that you say I must not be involved, so you are accountable. I don't think it's fair. Uh, and I, that, that's an area that I really believe. If I'm responsible for the department, let, that, let me be responsible for everything that affects the department so that I fall on my sword if something goes wrong in the department. Well, let's hear from Gautengers and the rest of uh, South Africans what uh, they have to say or what they have to ask you. Sake Dolonga says, what are his plans to enforce law and order in the Johannesburg CBD and make it clean again? As I said, crime, lawlessness, vandalism, corruption, if you can't tackle it, I can tell you those things will be a national anthem of this province or this country. We have to be merciless. So I agree with him. Uh, we, we want to prioritize fighting crime, but the second thing that we really want to take our energy on is to change the lives of our people in the townships, informal settlement, hostels, and rural areas. Some of those places are not fit for human consumption. We must be a generation 
that says we have eliminated informal settlement. We must be a generation that must not increase the current number of informal settlement, but decrease the current number of informal settlement. Life in informal settlement is unbearable. It's not a life's life, but that is increasing. Something that is not nice, it is increasing. There is a literally new informal settlement every day, uh, either in our province, in our country. We must put a stop there, deal with it, attend to it. And the hostels uh, 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 they are in a bad state. Uh, and, and, and some of our townships, anyone can build anything anytime anyway, uh, without either permission, without a license and other things. And the number of people that are illegal in those communities make planning extremely difficult. So we must zero in there and be fearless. Uh, and when you enter that space, you must know you've got the capacity to restore law and order. Well, speaking of which, uh, I, I mean, uh, I heard that there was uh, an idea, a thought, yeah. that, for example, one of the things you need to do is to separate uh, cooperative um, um, governance from uh, human settlements, make sure that to whoever focuses on uh, uh, human settlements then gets to deal with the very issues that you are talking about. Any truth to that rumor? You must pay that source. <laughs> they deserve that. to be paid. You must keep that source. Confirmed. Uh, let's get to, <laughs> let's get, <laughs> take a couple more. There's a shortage of classrooms in uh, Gauteng. Uh, we don't want his history of telling us about poor performing schools located in far flung townships as an alternative to parents living in suburbs or peri suburbs. When is he focusing on expanding classrooms of the good schools? Three times? I'm doing that. We've just given them, uh, I think, it's the eight million to expand with 656 uh, classrooms so you must check the school where he wants that expansion we met with the schools that uh, have high demand because we've got an online registration so you can easily keep track so on the basis of the applications we met with the principals and say you can go and build it it's not classroom on your own so whatever is suggesting we're already doing it but let's take a last one because mm -hmm. we've run out of time what should happen to a corruptor and a corruptee Orange overalls. Orange overalls. Orange overalls. Premier, congratulations Thank you, um, once again. Thank you. It's a pity, of course, um, this day was spoiled last night. Yeah. Um, Kaiser Chiefs between the <laughs> you know? um, No, I don't have time anymore for that. I'm sure you'll be fine. So, so one day I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah be assured. Uh, the birds will fly. They're currently walking when they've got the capacity to fly. They chose the wrong option to walk when they can fly. Thank you once again and best of luck. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. Well, the new Premier. Uh, of uh, the Gauteng province, Panyaza, Lesufi. After the break, safeguarding democracy amid increasing levels of voter apathy and mistrust. Welcome back. Uh, well, three surveys whose uh, results were released a couple of weeks ago commissioned or done in collaboration with the Independent Electoral Commission, pointed to a rather worrisome trend. Researchers are observing increasing levels of voter apathy. They are also seeing growing levels of mistrust. While they believe the phenomenon can only be a threat to our democracy, they also point out that uh, it is not something unique to South Africa. Nse Ufot is a visiting US-based voter rights activist who specializes in creating strategies for increased electoral participation. Good evening, thanks very much for your time. Good evening, thank you for having me. Well, as I was saying there, I mean, from, I mean, this, our independent electoral commission had this seminar a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. where they observed, you know, all these things. And the point they made was that, as much as we should be worried, mm -hmm. but it's also something that's also unique to us. Tell us what, in the, 
whether this is a case and to what extent in the U.S. system. I think that what we are living through and experiencing is in fact a global phenomenon. I think that with the shrinking of the world, if you will, the increased connectedness, um, that what we are experiencing are more sophisticated citizenry um, and a more sophisticated electorate where people have demands and there are things that they want for themselves. And the very real question what is the value of my vote is being asked and leaders who want to stay in power, uh, who want to be a part of a governing coalition have to have a legitimate answer for that. Young people are asking their questions. Quite frankly, there's nothing that focuses the mind like the credible threat of death. And so for those of us who've survived the pandemic, thinking about the role of government and keeping us safe, thinking about the role of government and governmental leaders in sort of helping shape the world that we want to live in now that we're reasonably assured that we're going to be here for some time. Um, those demands, those questions are coming. Um, and I think that misinformation and disinformation has also had an impact on what people understand about politics and what people understand about governing and government. Um, and so the smart parties, the smart electoral commissions, the smart leaders are thinking about how to answer that question honestly uh, to young people and folks who are questioning the value of their participation. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the parties in a short while. But these sophisticated um, um, voters, when they are unhappy with what they are seeing, with what they are hearing, with what, without, with what they are experiencing, mm -hmm. do they only choose to stay away? Or do some of them decide to get, to become more active, to right. change? Uh, so, so as to change the, right. the, the status quo? No, it's all of the above. That there are people who will go and look for a party with whom they are uh, ideologically aligned, right? So this particular party doesn't meet my needs. They don't serve my purposes. Its leaders are not speaking to the ambitions that I have for myself, for my family, for my community. Um, but the but the other alternative is people withdrawing from democratic participation altogether and that is the danger it's not that somebody will go and vote for the other guy is that people will withdraw and there will be fewer and fewer and fewer people making decisions on the part of the hold. And that's how you get authoritarian leadership. That's how you get unaccountable leadership. And that's where people like me, women and femmes and working people uh, and poor folks uh, who suffer greatly under that kind of account unaccountable leadership, unaccountable governments. So that's the real danger is the real question is that the decisions for the whole will be made by an unaccountable few and we can't have that happen. Well, let's talk about the former for, for a second um, because where those who decide to pull out mm -hmm. not to participate in democratic and they processes, are the majority yes right uh, that then goes to the credibility of the elections we you know hold um, and that becomes a problem and what um, the former chief electoral officer who is now one of the commissioners mm -hmm. in the independent electoral commission said uh, the day they came here after this uh, a seminar that they had was that they are now left with the responsibility of having to ensure um, that people don't lose hope and faith Mm. in the electoral system yet they are not responsible you know for uh, what um, people are doing it is actually the politicians okay. um, who are uh, messing with people's feelings hopes um, okay. and aspirations to the extent that people no longer uh, now want to, um, to 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 participate and they're saying whatever they are trying to do as in uh, I mean they're throwing money you know at it you know civic education voter education campaigns and so on but these campaigns are making very little if any difference and that's a dilemma this independent electoral body is finding itself in right well i would argue that it is all of our work that it is not the exclusive domain of an independent electoral body to ensure the integrity of our elections and to ensure that people are participating in democracy that democracy isn't a state right that we have achieved or we are arrived that it is a process by which we make decisions about the kind of country that we want to live in and because 
because it is a living and dynamic process, ensuring the integrity of the process, ensuring that as many people participate as possible, ensuring that the process is inclusive, it is all of our work, including political parties. Um, and so I imagine that if there is only one section of civil society that's working on it, it will seem like an insurmountable task. But that's why the work that my colleagues at like Ravonia Circle are doing, it's really thinking about the process of bringing people in, of choosing leaders, who is going to co-govern with the people who see themselves as the sort of, uh, again, accountable leaders and, and maintaining that dialogue. And that's not on an electoral timeline. Well, that is year round work. Yeah, let's talk then about, about political parties because um, uh, something you often hear uh, people saying is that you have a big, oh, used to be very big, but not anymore, um, political party that dominated the political landscape for, 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 for quite a while. But over the years, of course, the numbers have been going down and down and down. But increasingly, you're hearing people saying, but the opposition is really no different. It's not offering us anything, mm. you know, different or new or attractive, you know. Uh, I said you're having like a lot of new entrants, but we're not making any serious um, inroads, mm -hmm. except those who have tried, but some of whom have now started going down again, right. without reaching the, the requisite numbers, you know, that would um, uh, create a situation like you have mm -hmm. in the United States, where you're between the Democrats and liberals, it's anyone's game, yeah. you know, depending on a particular <laughs> point in time in history and whoever else is involved. But by and large, that's what you have. Yeah. We don't have that. I also don't know if that's the best system, right? Um, we're me. talking about a nation of 300 million people. The idea that there are only two major political parties feels like there is there leaves a lot in terms on the table in terms of representation. Oh, outcomes, and then though. you think about our neighbors to the north, Canada, that there are more people who live in California, one state, than in the entire country of Canada. And Canada has at least four major political parties that are contesting for power in Parliament. Um, this is what I'll say: is that uh, I mean the parliamentary system um, is one that allows for, I think, more accountability um, than what exists uh, in the United States. Like, we can't just call elections when the people have made a decision um, that, uh, you know, they've lost confidence in leaders and the electorate. What I will also say is that it is time to compete for hearts and minds and eyeballs and ears and attention and for people's votes. And so one party has dominated and we are seeing a decline in that party. So what's going to happen? It will be a future where they will return to the one sort of near total domination mm -hmm. or that the, the votes will continue to decline. and other parties and other leaders will fill in that space but but, but what do these what do these uh, uh parties do you know um to 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 occupy the space we're talking about the small political parties that are already part of the system mm -hmm. some of whom are, are, are represented in parliament or mm -hmm. provincial legislatures already mm -hmm. but you're also talking about new entrants like your Rivonia circles mm -hmm. who have invited you i mean to to share your experiences and um, what do they need to do because remember the uh, uh, the slower the pace you know, or the more people see that these people can't make inroads anyway, right. then the more, more and more people get tired. Right. Well, I of, think of, of that's the whole thing, and then lose hope that these people will ever exactly. be able to make a significant. Well, and I think that that is actually, in fact, the genius of Rivonia Circle because it's not a political party, right? The kinds of conversations that need to happen, the kind of civic education that needs to happen, the kind of bringing in South African youth and new people to the political process cannot happen on an electoral timeline. It just cannot. It needs to be year round work, right? What and the way that we train our organizers at the New Georgia Project is that you have twice as many ears as you do mouths. And so we should be listening to the people of South Africa. We should be listening to the people in these provinces because people will tell you what their hopes are, what their fears are, what their ambitions are for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. But, but, and the smart party is connecting the power of the vote and voting for our party with 
um, you know, the things, the changes that they have told us that they want to see. But, but what are the practical things that, I mean, they, 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 they do? I mean, we're talking, our uh, uh, electoral law mm -hmm. is being changed as, as we speak, for mm -hmm. example, to accommodate independence mm -hmm. and, of course, I mean, all these parties that are being formed uh, left, right and center. But what are the things that they need to do to be able to claim the space? They need to canvas. They need to knock on doors. How is that different from what is being done by established parties? I don't think that that's being done by established parties at scale. I mean, I think that it is a tactic that people are aware of. I don't think that it's happening at scale. And I don't, and I think, and I don't think that it's happening outside of an elections timeline. So people don't have an opportunity to hear what you, what uh, the party stands for, and people certainly don't have an opportunity to tell the party what should be on the platform, what they should be fighting for. Like the, there's a, there's a, there's a, politics is not the exclusive domain of the elite. Right. And so if you are already a member and you're already going to the conventions, like those are not the people that we're talking about. Those are not the people that we're trying to bring into the process. We're trying to bring into the people, people into the process who have just thrown their hands up and they don't believe you. They don't believe the leaders are going to do what they're going to say they're going to do. They don't believe that their vote matters. They don't believe that there's a future for them in South Africa at all. A South Africa where, where they can move from just surviving to thriving. Right. And what is tr what, what needs to happen in this moment is the idea that, you know, Frederick Douglass says that power concedes nothing without a demand. What is the organized demand and who are the people that will co-govern with citizens as they're headed into parliament? And what becomes the responsibility of civil society, especially those who aren't necessarily interested in, you know, being part of the politics, political system or political parties, but want all the good and right things to happen to them. What becomes their responsibilities? How do they claim the space? Absolutely. It, it matters. It matters. There are things that people care about. And there are things that if you're willing to protest for something, then you're definitely willing to go out and vote for it. And so again, thinking about civil society, thinking about the world that we want to live in, the world that we want to shape um, and how to go about doing it is, I think, really important. And I actually think that it's motivational. And I think that that's the thing that brings people back on board. You can only press the outrage button so long. You can only press the anger button so long. I will send angry tweets in all caps and I can go, I can go pretty long. I can argue with people on the internet for a while. But at some point, we have to figure out what is it that we are going to do? Not what are we going to say. What is it that we're going to do? in this moment to bring about the outcomes that we seek. And Sarah Ofut, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. She's of course a visiting US-based voter rights activist coming to share uh, her experiences, thoughts and insights uh, with some South African organizations uh, invited um, this time around by the Iroonia Circle. That's our show for this evening. Do join us again tomorrow night, same time. Have a good night.